one cannot understand the debilitating effect of a long-term illness or physical disability unless you've lived it. For 25 and a half years, I was the primary caregiver of my bride. The good news is that I had her for 25 and a half years. Uh, The bad news was that she spent way too much of that time depressed. Right after she had the accident that paralyzed her, she uh, announced that God was going to heal her. And I know that I prayed that every day as long as she was on this earth. But uh, she also dealt with depression. Why hadn't God healed her? And it usually came out when I would put her to bed. I would do a standing pivot transfer. And uh, when I would have my arms around her and she was up erect, it was basically a full body hug. And crying. And it would always play with my mind that that is the moment she felt like crying even though I knew that was because that was when she felt safe. One day, I don't know, nine or ten years after the accident, she decided that we needed to seek professional help in her healing. She wanted to go to a Benny Hinn healing crusade. And so I took her down to Nashville, And it was announced in the service that if you stayed to the very end, uh, the pastor would come by and pray for everybody individually. And so we stayed, and it was 4 o'clock in the morning there in the Grand Ole Opry building before he got around to praying for people. 4 o'clock in the morning. And so he went around, and he was praying for people, and he was praying for people, and he got to us, and Berta looked like a kid in a candy shop, and he went right past us, walked around us. And Berta gave me one of those looks that husbands are familiar with. Without words, the wife is saying, do something. And so I started shouting. And he tried to go on with the service and ignored me, and I shouted all the louder. And so he finally realized that he wasn't going anywhere until he did what I wanted him to do. And so he motioned for us to come over to the side, and Berta had someone pray for her. And absolutely nothing happened except I had firm and sure knowledge that healing comes from the Savior, not from a person. The story today is the last story in this series that we've been in about six weeks that I announced at the very beginning was going to open with the healing of a blind person and would close with the healing of blind Bartimaeus. Now you may wonder why we know Bartimaeus' name. Scholars think it's because the early church knew who he was. And therefore, telling his story and naming him Uh, could verify that this was, in fact, the truth in this section that opens and closes with the healing of a blind man three times Jesus tells that he will go to the cross and die as our Savior. Three times he tells the story. Three times the disciples are blind to the fact Jesus is the Savior. Three times you see this opportunity to see what in this story only happens to be seen by blind people. Jesus is the Messiah. He's the Savior promised. And so we have this concluding section. Now again, let me remind you in Mark's Gospel, you pay not only attention to what the story actually says, but where the story is located because it's a travel log. Wherever you are in relationship to Jerusalem, in relationship to the cross, that tells you what's going on in the story. This is the last 
thing said before Jesus goes on the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. The very next verse after I finish reading today, the disciples and Jesus head into Jerusalem for that which we would call Palm Sunday. So this is the closeout of everything Jesus has wanted to do with his disciples on the earth to teach, to prepare, to let them know what they need to know in order to be followers of the Savior. From Mark 10 at verse 46. They came to Jericho. As he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, my teacher, Rabboni, let me see again. Jesus said to him, go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Father, may the word of my mouth, the thought, the meditation, the heart of all here today be acceptable, or in the name of Jesus become acceptable. You alone are our strength, our Redeemer. Amen. The story concludes with Jesus announcing, Go, your faith has made you well. And so we have here the understanding of faith providing what's needed in times of distress. Everything before that last verse, though, is telling us how you got there, how you have faith, how you live out faith. Now, I want to disagree with the translators on one word. Go, your faith has made you. Our text says, well, the Greek word there is sozo. Typically, sozo is translated as saved. Go, your faith has saved you, would be how I would translate it. But because we're dealing with a physical disability, the translator said, go, your faith has made you well. The fact is that sozo is talking about spiritual salvation and more. It's a fourfold salvation. You're saved physically, yes. Today, his faith made him well. You're also saved spiritually. Your relationship with Christ is such that you will spend eternity with God. It also saves you emotionally. For He has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, a sound mind. As I get close to 60, and that's Wednesday, As I get close to 60, I like reminding God of that promise of a sound mind more and more. Senility is going to be a very easy transition for me. And we're saved relationally. When I have that relationship with Christ and you have that relationship with Christ, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. Mary gave a a beautiful testimony yesterday at Robert Gurley's funeral service about his words to her when she joined the church. Now we're family. And the impact that had on her, most eloquent. And so this fourfold salvation is at work by faith. Because he chose to believe And you see this process working its way out from the very first, you see the process. 
they come to Jericho, they enter Jericho, they walk out Jericho, and they're on the far side, and absolutely nothing happens. Jesus has come, he's been, he's gone, and nothing. Do you imagine? Do you imagine there weren't any that needed healing in Jericho? I imagine there might have been many. But when you need sozo, you have to look to the Savior. And you don't have anybody that cries out to Jesus until you get outside of town. And outside of town, there's this blind guy. He has nothing to offer. He's blind. He's a beggar. Blindness, he can't do anything for you. He, he can't help in any physical way. He's a beggar. He has no money. He has no economic standing. He has no political standing. He has no authority whatsoever. He's the lowest of the low. But he has one thing. He sees who Jesus is. The seeing people are blind in this section of Mark's gospel. And the blind people see. Now pay attention to what's said here. The crowd tells him this is Jesus of Nazareth. That's what they tell him. That's what he hears. What does he respond He shouts out, Jesus, son of David. That's a messianic term. It's a coincidence in my Bible that if I continue on in that column, the the Jesus, son of David, is in the left column. And if I continue highlighting on to the right column, as I did this morning, I get the crowd going into Jerusalem shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And it speaks of the house of David. In Luke chapter 2, the birth narrative, we're told that Mary and Joseph go to Bethlehem to register because Joseph was of the house and the lineage of David. Matthew makes a big deal out of the idea that Jesus is the son of David, the promised one. Mark, the only place in the whole gospel where Jesus is directly called son of David is this one passage. This one passage is the only place that, and it's a blind guy who sees it. He hears Jesus of Nazareth. He replies, Jesus, the promised one, the the son of David. We're told in 2 Samuel that God has promised that the house, the lineage of David will never die out. There will always be one to occupy the throne of that kingdom. Jesus is the one promised. So says Bartimaeus, the blind guy. Now what happens? The crowd sternly orders him to be quiet. That happens when faith gets going. The community doesn't want to put up with it. Hush. Sit down. Shut up. He cries out all the louder. He drops off the name. The second time he doesn't say Jesus. He just uses the title. Son of David, have mercy on me. Now, where do you and I fit in the story? We fit in the first half of the very next verse. Now, the story is told about uh, a father and a son arguing. The son wants a, a car, and the father wants the hair cut on the son. And, and uh, the son argues that, he needs long hair. Jesus had long hair. And daddy said, yeah, and Jesus walked everywhere. So I'm told. This one time Jesus doesn't walk anywhere. Verse 49. 
Jesus stood still. Did you catch that? He's not going anywhere. He's standing still and said, call him here. That's our job. To call people to come to the one who can heal, who can save, who can redeem, who can deliver. And they called the blind man. Now listen to this. Take heart. Take heart. They don't say, come here. They say, have hope. Get your hopes up. Get ready. Something good is going to happen today. Take heart. Get up. He is calling you. That's our job. Now, some things are missing in this story that are present in every other healing story in Mark's gospel. Among them, Jesus doesn't take this guy off in an isolated place to healing. There's no hiding the miracle. The whole crowd sees it. He's calling the blind guy to him, where usually he takes and goes to the person who wants to be healed, and they go off and they get in isolation. And what else happens? After the healing, he says what? Don't tell. What I refer to as the messianic secret. There's no messianic secret here. The whole crowd knows it. It's no longer a secret. Jesus is the Savior, and it leads to the cross. Then Jesus said to him, oh, verse 50, So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rabboni, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has... Sozoed you, has healed you, has saved you, has redeemed you, has restored you. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him, Jesus, on the way. Trivia question What was the first title for our religion? What did they call us before they called us Christian? People of people of not people of God. People of the way. Thank you. People of the way. It wasn't until we got to Antioch that they called us Christian. Up until then, they called us people of the way. And so he immediately regained his sight. And followed him, Jesus, on the way. He doesn't just get healed. He gets saved and joins the crowd figuratively, literally, going into Jerusalem to the triumphal entry. I've already told you that the reason they think this guy was named Bartimaeus is named by name is the early church knew him. They knew him as... Probably St. Bartimaeus, one of the old saints of the congregation. But you know, behind every saint is a sinner. Back there somewhere. And that's this one's story. Nothing to offer except he recognizes who Jesus is and he won't be shut up. And that's faith in action. The thing is... This is God writing Bartimaeus' story. God wants to write our story too. God wants to reach out to us. We may not have anything to offer except recognizing who the Savior is. That's Jesus. And we won't be shut up. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen.